So, welcome everybody. My name is Simon Stevens. I'm the Head of Publications and Events at the Museums Association. Uh, we're delighted you can all join us. This is a third of our series of support nightly coronavirus conversations. We kicked off with a look at leadership in a crisis. Then a fortnight ago, we covered, uh, had a great session on workforce. And today we're looking at the hot topic of museums reopening following the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I've got my colleague Rebecca working in the background to make sure the tech runs smoothly, which I'm sure it will, but do bear, 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 bear with this if there are any problems. Uh, a reminder that these online events are free. Uh, they're for MA members, uh, individual members, and those who work in institutions of MA members. So you will hopefully have had read the document that we sent you in advance of the meeting, but just in case you missed anything, here are a few key uh, bits of advice before we start. You should all be muted automatically. If not, please mute yourselves. We have both the chat function and the Q&A function uh, running in this meeting. The chat function is for sharing ideas and thoughts and web links between the whole group, including the speakers. But the Q&A function should be used to ask questions of the speakers. Uh, and the chair will keep an eye on these questions. Do try and keep your questions uh, short and to the point, please, because that will help. Uh, there is an option of being anonymous if you ask questions, but it's better if you could say who you are. Uh, you can also leave and rejoin the meeting at any time. And uh, a quick reminder that we are recording this session. And also, if you're using Twitter, there is a hashtag for today's um, webinar. The hashtag is MA uh, Coronavirus Conversations. Now, with all that done, I will hand over to our chair, who is Sharon Hill, the Director of the Museums Association, and she will introduce the speakers and the session itself. Thanks. Thank you, Simon, and a big thank you to all Museums Association staff who've helped set up this session. And welcome to all of you who've come along. I think we've got about five or 600 people booked on. We unfortunately can't see all of you because I'm sure we would love to be in the same room as you at a conference or seminar, but hopefully you can see and hear us. This, as Simon said, is the third in our MA webinar series, Coronavirus Conversations. And today we're looking at reopening, a subject that is close to all of our hearts. For the past three months, for the first time in a generation at least, all museums throughout the UK have been closed. So reopening is a big topic and we're going to do our best to get some answers and some expertise from our panel. We've been working as the MA with other sector organisations to get reopening advice and guidance out to the sector during this crisis. So please be aware that advice is on our website and other organisations such as NMDC and AIM. And I know that in England, Museum Development have been doing sessions with Q&A to interrogate some of that real practical advice that you need. Also, bear in mind that we know and you know culture is a devolved responsibility. So colleagues in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland are working to different timelines and are working hard to publish advice on reopening. I'm going to ask the panel to reflect on a number of questions and you will also get a chance to ask questions. But let me begin by introducing the fabulous panel we have in conversation today. To begin, we have David Martin, who is a direct, David Mann, who is a director or, and a trustee of the Scottish Maritime Museum. David comes from a commercial background. He's the chair of Industrial Museum Scotland and is on several other boards, including the Skylark Trust, which is a, an organisation which works with people with addiction to restore a Dunkirk ship. David is passionate about using his museum to give young people from all backgrounds the chance to work, learn and succeed. Next we have Steve Miller, Director of Culture and Heritage at Norfolk County Council and Director of Norfolk Museum Service. Steve was previously Chief Exec of Ironbridge Gorge Museums and Director of Norton Priory Museum. Steve is passionate about making museums accessible to all and about finding new ways to make museums a vital partner in the world. Finally, we have Laura Pye, the Director of National Museums Liverpool. Laura's a scouser and she was previously Head of Culture for Bristol City Council. She was also the Interim Heritage and Culture Manager for Warwickshire County Council. Laura's early career in museums was focused mainly on education and she's a passionate believer that museums are for everyone that they should be safe and welcoming spaces for people to explore their identity, to learn new things, or to simply chill out. I think that's an amazing way to go into the first question, which is what will reopening look like from the perspective of your museum? Can I put that to you first, David? Oh, David's gone, no. Can I put that to you first, Steve? 
Uh, thank you, Sharon. You can and um, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'll begin with the uh, the headline from Norfolk Museum Service. We we don't have a confirmed uh, date or dates for reopening yet, um, but what we're working towards in the next few weeks is a phased approach. So we have ten museums within the Norfolk Museum Service family, and the three largest museums: Gresson Old Farm and Workhouse, Norwich Castle Museum, and Art Gallery and Time and Tide are the uh, the three sites that we're hoping to bring online first so Gresnell with it being open air a heritage working farm and 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 workhouse and grounds uh, probably feels the, the easiest of those because of the outdoor nature and also because as a heritage working farm we're very used to uh, hand washing and and all the kind of health and safety uh, and hygiene facilities which are required for school groups and visitors to that part of it so some of the things that we're, we're using as guiding principles which i know will apply to many others on, on the call today and listening uh, is slow and steady we want the approach to be safety first so that's absolutely critical safety first approach for for our museum staff and volunteers and also uh, critically our visitors. Uh, we're a large uh, local authority led uh, county service. So again, we take some of those decisions and lead uh, for a lot of those uh, approaches and timescales, but ultimately we're part of a local authority system. So some parity with uh, some of the other services that are coming back online at the moment, libraries, recycling centers, uh, et cetera, is important for us. Um, we've all seen over the last few weeks, I think, uh, that news can change and change quickly. Two metres can become one metres, one metres can become one point something metres. So again, the agile approach that we are adopting is based on the fact that that could change and that could change a few weeks in. So we might get so far down the line, we might have to accelerate things or, or put the brakes on a little bit. And finally, from us, um, a critical point, which again will be, uh, I guess, uh, applicable to many people, is that a lot of the Norfolk Museum Service staff with us being local authority um, have been seconded. So some staff have been furloughed and, and some staff have been seconded to uh, essential local authority duties, uh, helping support the vulnerable uh, communities that we have in Norfolk, uh, distributing food and many coordinating volunteers and, and things like that. So we have to get some of those staff back from those essential duties, which I think we are in now uh, a, a position to, to, to do so. So that's probably the, uh, the headlines from, from Norfolk. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Steve. And um, just on that point about one metre or two metre, and I know it's different in, in different nations, I was giving evidence to the House of Lords Committee on the impact of coronavirus yesterday with Ian Watson from Tyne and Weir Museums, and they decided instead of saying one metre or two, two metres, they used Roman shields to mark out the space that people should stay apart, which is approximately somewhere between one and two metres, and have used that as a, a graphic way of showing the distance. And the idea is really, you know, keep your distance. Uh, whether it's one or two metres. David, we lost you for a minute there, but yeah. uh, do you want to reflect on, on that question about, uh, you know, how, where is, what is reopening looking like from where you're sitting? Yeah, we I mean, much the same. Safety will be the key issue for us as well, uh, both of staff and visitors. We're looking at uh, reopening on the 7th of August, if we can manage that date, but the final decision will be taken into consideration both safety and finance we need to make sure it's prudent for us to open uh, and ensure it makes financial sense for us to open rather than to continue the way we are uh, and we'll look at that first i think the the biggest thing for me in re reopening will be the, the use of checklists we'll be uh, taking the guideline using guideline checklists creating our own checklists and making sure staff have checklists coming out of their ears uh, and working through that our staff will be are starting to come back off furlough now. We furloughed virtually everybody uh, in March. Uh, we're bringing them back gradually uh, and at time to work through the systems. And once one group have worked through risk assessments and made everything safe, we'll bring the next section in uh, and we'll amend and change and, and reimagine those risk assessments and work processes uh, and work through that. And as we continue to bring staff on, we'll take feedback from staff and that'll continue right through to opening where we'll take feedback on our safety measures and our new working practices from visitors. 
And to that end, I think we will probably open uh, the Friday, Saturday and Sunday, the 7th, 8th and 9th of August, and then close again for a day on the Monday to allow us to reflect on the impact of having visitors in the building uh, and then look at what changes we need to make to working practices and implement those across that, the Monday and possibly the Tuesday before reopening fully again. So it is, as uh, Steve said, it is that slow approach to it. It's that taking care to make sure that uh, everything's in, in place, that we're, we're looking at it. We, we've taken the decision already that, that no matter what happens up here in Scotland, we're still at two metres up here that we will stay at two metres uh, in the museum. We're fortunate. We have uh, a large open space museum at one site. One's, one's a little more difficult to, uh, than our Dumbarton site, but we'll certainly uh, keep that on, on two metres space. Uh, from the Scottish perspective, from the 15th of July is the date that we are due to open. At the moment, the feedback is less than 10% of museums will open on the 15th of July, uh, and that most will open between August and September, uh, and some won't open at all until next April. So that, that's where we're looking at uh, up here. Thank you, David. And I think that point about flexibility of approach is critical, isn't it? And, you know, I know we've all been reflecting that people want a definite date for opening ministers and, and the public probably alike want us to be able to say all museums in Scotland will be open on this date, but it just doesn't work like that. And actually a little bit of R&D and a little bit of innovation and a little bit of experimentation wouldn't go amiss. So we're getting some questions queuing in here, which is great. Thank you to the audience. We've got 480 people on this webinar, which is fantastic. And Laura, can I go to you next for reflections on what reopening will look like from the perspective of National Museums Liverpool? Yeah, of course. Hello, everybody. Um, so we've had obviously very long conversations about not just so much what it will look like, but actually what it will feel like, which is equally important to us. Um, you know, we work in museums and I want our sites to feel like museums when they reopen. Um, so, you know, if, if people wanted to do the experience of a supermarket, they'd be in a supermarket. They don't want that. We don't believe when, when they come to our sites. So we've had a lot of conversations about that. We're looking at a kind of phased approach to reopening. We are hoping to open our World Museum site and our Walker Art Gallery within the next few weeks. Um, we chose those venues first for a number of reasons. One, they have the biggest local audience. Uh, and two, there, there are two traditional sites which actually make social distancing a bit easier within them. They are, they're designed to have natural one-way routes around them and they've got two staircases and all of those kind of things that makes that easier. And then we'll look to open our waterfront venues some point in August and then Lady Lever and Sudley will open at some point after that. We'll only be opening for five days a week, so we'll be opening from Wednesday to Sunday, um, which gives us the two days to do that reflection piece that David was talking about. We, we feel that that's important, that this is an ever-changing piece and it's going to change all of the time. And I think if we've learned anything in the last 15 weeks, it's that this changes every two minutes. So. Um, having some time where we're shut to the public is I think going to be important for that and and you'll see you know the museums will look slightly different I guess we will have a huge amount of signage that talks about we talk about social distancing so we will still be trying to keep it at two meters our, 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 our marks on the floor are at two meters um, but you know we talk about social distancing you will see a whole load of hand sanitizers around the site but we wanted to make sure that we were, that feel was still there. So we talked a lot about our values as an organization and we talk as our values around being um, welcoming and educational. And we, and we, and honest is, is the third one, just to clarify, but the, the welcoming and, and the educational thing was really important to us. I don't want to put people on a conveyor belt through the gallery to see things they don't want to see or to miss the things they do want to see kind of thing. So there we will be, uh, suggesting a route round and we will slightly gently be directing people and in some cases there'll be one way in and one way out of a gallery we didn't want to create a really strong one-way system all the way around because we didn't feel that that was a particularly welcoming or allowed people to to explore their interests which is ultimately what we're about as a site so there's been a whole load of conversations um my my colleagues my some of my colleagues in world museum and walker and a lot of my union colleagues who are drowning in risk assessments. So thanks to them at the moment, because there's a huge amount of tick lists and things to get through. Um, and, and we're going to have to 
feel our way through this with with the support of staff and union colleagues to be able to get that right i mean david's right in that sense it will change um we just need to be open to that change and it feels a bit weird doesn't it because you know we normally open the doors seven days a week this is what we do we're used to that and suddenly it feels very different and that's a bit weird to get used to yeah absolutely i think we're all trying to get used to new ways of working and new ways of being in the world really interesting question here from malcolm fitzel from the national maritime museum of ireland uh, he says we're very dependent on volunteers many of whom are older therefore high risk. Just wondering how are the volunteer dependent museums are managing this? And I know you will all have volunteers to one degree or another, uh, but David, from another Maritime Museum perspective, do you, and I know you do have a lot of volunteers, do you want to uh, come in on that? Yeah, we, we've contacted some of the volunteers, not all of our volunteers, uh, and to a certain extent they, they are additional, so we, we at the moment, we don't rely on the volunteers to be able to open and, and, and look after the museum. Uh, however, there, there are issues uh, with bringing in uh, the older group that tend to volunteer with us, particularly the older engineers, uh, and we're looking at creating safe spaces for them. Uh, they all used to come in, part of their enjoyment was all coming in at the same time and all uh, having a chat and a coffee and, a, and, and all those things. And we'll need to, to work out a rotor that allows us to to space those out, bring them in in different days, bring them in in small groups that they normally work in anyway, and, and look at how we do that slightly differently. But fortunately, we don't need them to open the, the, the museum up, but there are a lot of volunteer museums that will struggle to get that age group in that they're reliant on uh, for doing that, and, and they're having to look at ways to do that. We will have increased staff costs anyway when we open, but it will be a bigger impact than those volunteer-run museums. Thank you, David. Laura or Steve, do you want to come in on that question of volunteers, Laura? I mean, you know, we have a large number of volunteers, but again, not uh, we're not reliant on them in terms of opening. But what I would say is actually, I have exactly the same problem with my staff team. Um, so, you know, staff capacity is a real issue, whether that's because of shielding or whether it's because of being in a vulnerable category or whether it's because of childcare or carers' responsibilities, you know, all of the schools are not back in Liverpool at this moment in time and I know we'll be going into the summer holidays and you could argue that childcare should have been you know dealt with in that sense but you know we've just had 15 weeks where the kids haven't been in school so childcare is a massive massive issue for a lot of our staff who simply will not be able to be back in work because of their childcare responsibilities or carers responsibilities. Just, uh, Steve did you want to come in on that one as well? Yeah I mean it's a really interesting uh, point and 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 critical i think we've got nearly 400 active volunteers at norfolk museum service and they do vital work i think our plan is in the first phase that we will rely on staff in terms of basic opening and getting things back up and running but what we've been doing over the last three months and we might talk about it, i guess a little bit later on is, is, is the digital channels and some of the things that we're doing but we've had probably more volunteering over the last three months through different means than we ever had what I think as has been uh, pointed out a few times uh, you know recently the, 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 a lot of our volunteers across museums of all sizes are often retired and those are the people who possibly are, are the most um, um, at risk in some ways but also you know we have a duty of care to keep those volunteers safe so balancing that kind of social um, um you know need that that the people have to be with others and to help and support with with keeping people safe is probably the biggest um conversation that we've got at the moment but certainly those digital documentation projects and uh we've got volunteers at the moment working on a tapestry for us there's huge amounts of volunteering going on but the point when we feel safe and able to get them back on site is probably a little bit further down the line than when we start to sort of get to the immediate reopening plans. Great. There's, I think we've lost David again, but we've got lots and lots of questions coming through. Just to add on volunteers, I know the National Trust in Scotland and in England and Wales are rethinking their whole model because they're so reliant on volunteers, which is not to say they want to exclude any of their existing volunteers, they want to bring them back safely, but it has put a sharp focus on the idea of the demographics of our volunteers as they exist at the moment. Uh, an interesting question here about navigating the potential for local lockdowns. We've just 
seen Leicester go into a local lockdown and there's talk about other areas of the UK potentially being in local lockdowns. How do we, how do we navigate that? Um, because there's some particular issues, obviously, not just in terms of, of going, closing the museum again, but if there are staff who live in a lockdown area and can't get into the museum, again, it, it places a pressure on the institution. Any, any thoughts or is it, are you doing any contingency planning around local lockdowns or second wave, in fact? We, we certainly haven't um, done any contingency planning as such, but obviously the reality is if we're told to lock down, we'll lock down. But, you know, it, it, it will be that simple in exactly the same way it happened the first time. And we've done it once now. <laughs> you know, in theory, hopefully we can learn all those lessons we learned from the last time. But we, we will be guided by medical advice on that. We will only be opening our doors if it's safe to do so. And if someone tells us, you know, if our, if our director of public health says to me, Laura, it's not safe, I'll shut the sites. Yeah, I think that's the best advice we can give on that one, isn't it? And although it's easier said than done, we have gone through the process once, so we, we know how to shut down operations. There's an interesting question here about um, gauging feedback from visitors and communities about their own appetite and readiness to come back into the space. I know there's been some national surveys, so I know Scott Informed did a survey in Scotland, didn't they, David? But I just wonder, I think the question is more aimed at have you done any local visitor or member surveys to try and gauge readiness to come back lost david again so i'm going to ask you laura because i know you have in Liverpool. yeah yeah yes we did so uh, we did that quite a few weeks ago now um and we probably will do it again um just to gauge where that goes at a later date but we did a survey through all of our social media channels we got a reasonably good response to that survey we were quite pleased by the response but the response was also quite positive. It was slightly more positive than the national surveys in terms of readiness to come back, um, which I guess you might expect because the people who were filling in the survey were people who were following us on social media. So we already had a relationship and maybe a relationship of trust there. Um, but yeah, there's certainly the relationship, the research shows that people are keen to come back. And certainly if I go by the amount of Twitter comments asking me when we're reopening, people seem quite keen to come back when they believe it's you know safe to do so thanks steve have you tested the appetite locally yes um i think i think the uh, and same as laura we've got um some fantastic season ticket holders the museum pass uh, holders who are kind of our uh, immediate uh, focus group if you like and when we get to the point of reopening we expect <clears throat> for the first few days to be able to offer those time tickets to that particular group and just allow us to test that but in a safe way that gives them a bit of preferential uh, access. Um, coming back to Gresson Hall with it being open air we don't think that we'll have too many problems around um, uh, that in, 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 in lots of ways so again I think the test for would you come back to an open air site with plenty of space around and no worries about social distancing that response will be slightly different than would you go into a confined space but you know frankly we've also tried to play ourselves into the future a little bit and i had to give a presentation to our sort of um, local authority gold command emergency structure and i did actually point out that you know we've got to think ourselves into a world where while safe and and uh, Thanks for that. David, we've got you back again. We're just talking about that question of uh, feedback from uh, visitors, whether you've tested the appetite there for people coming back into the museum space. We, we, we haven't gone out to the, the, the wider uh, visitors. We've gone out to our members and they're all, all quite keen. Uh, we've also gone out to our uh, schools that we use quite a lot and uh, the feedback from them is that they're, they're not really interested in coming this side of uh, the new year but certainly they, they would all be quite keen to go back out again uh, in the, the terms in the new year coming forward uh, and the argument is that, that they are going to be back in classrooms anyway particularly in the lower schools uh, and, kind of, and with no social distancing so why not let them come out and enjoy uh, the museums and do that outdoor learning that everybody's so keen that they undertake and, and go forward with that so we, we're hopeful that that will start up again in the coming week the local community we've been in touch with the local community and we're keen to drive that market forward as a, as a key in working with the local community 
but then making sure also that anybody that's visiting the museums make sure or takes good license of making sure the local community is safe. So we're working with them to make sure that that happens. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that that reliance and the connection to local communities is going to be absolutely critical in the reopening and in the months and, and years that follow. And an interesting question following on from some of the points you've just made, David, from Jen at the Barber Institute of Fine Arts in Birmingham. Can the panellists please let us know about their learning and engagement of public programmes and what they look like for reopening and the subsequent period. I know there's been a, a lot of discussion amongst learning and engagement staff about how we respond to lockdown and then how we respond to the reopening of museums. So would any of you like to talk about what you've put in place in terms of, of public programming? Steve, did you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, I would say the learning teams over the past three months at Norfolk Museums have been um, amazing and basically made a, a, a sort of a channel shift within uh, days. Uh, so most of the school programmes, Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2, um, under fives programmes went online and have been very well received. So within days, we were basically providing that support for homeschooling. Um, as far as public programmes are concerned, we we are going to look at the summer of basically just opening as as is um, and try and look a little bit further ahead in terms of autumn. Um, a lot of our bigger projects, again, the sort of programmes went online and whether we keep them sort of a mix of virtual and 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 site-based uh, programs we're still working through at the moment but um yeah lots lots of really important questions still without clear answers at the moment i mean we're we're just currently doing a survey with teachers to see what we what they will need from us when they go back in september to look at that formal education stuff we've obviously put some stuff digitally and we've been supporting homeschooling in that sense in terms of our public program a bit like see we we've said well let let's open let's just open see what that looks like but we've got a couple of big events so for example our slavery remembrance day that we do every year in in august and um, we've we've reformatted that so we've just doing some commissions of artistic responses that will be digital we will have a, we will do a digital presence so our lecture will go digitally we've done some artist commissions we've been doing some uh, community conversations and that kind of thing so what is normally a, a walk of remembrance through the city centre and, and a libation event uh, will be done in a different way and will be done digitally so that we still mark that occasion as we have done for the past 20 years. Fantastic to hear that you're going to be able to do that and I know there's been some key moments in time and anniversaries during the course of lockdown and going forward that we will still want to mark in our museums and as part of our public programmes. Uh, a, good, a good question here about what we've learned during lockdown and how we might change as a result of that. So I think Steve, you referred to that earlier about use of digital media, internet, Zoom, etc. Uh, so there's something in that for perhaps our engagement with the public, but also in working patterns and, and how we work as a sector. We've lost David again. So <laughs> I'm going to go to you, Laura, uh, for any reflections on the things that we'd like to keep or the things that we've learned. I, I think that working pattern thing is the key thing. You know, I, I've been at National Museums Liverpool for two years. I spent 18 months banging on about the fact that it was the 21st century and we should be paperless and we introduced new systems and we used Microsoft 365 and Teams and things like that. Lockdown was the best thing in the world for that. Absolutely the best thing in the world for that because suddenly there was a real incentive to use the chat function and to engage through teams and to collaborate on the same documents and work in a completely different way. And I hope we keep that really um, as much as anything else to be cheaper from my office capacity point of view. But you know, that whole thing about, you know, I've done meetings that have been all over the world that you know whereas i used to travel to london probably every other week every week maybe i'm not sure i want to continue to do that and really do i need to because you can you can be in the room without being in the room and i think we've proved that over the last 15 weeks did you have any thoughts on that about how we'll take some of the good stuff and and keep hold of that yeah, yeah, very much so. And I think, again, some of those channels that we've opened up, we wouldn't want to close down. So they're hugely helpful uh, ways of communicating with um, 
with the, uh, the, 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 the public, with schools, we would want to keep that. Um, the innovations, which again have been made around things like virtual escape rooms, we've created murder mysteries, that's been really good in the short term, but could also um, be a good way of working. And certainly the local authorities have been very, very uh, impressed with how home working has gone in a lot of instances. So that might be a broad approach, probably not all the time, but we might keep an element of that more working from home, which again would cut down travel. It's in the sort of spirit of the uh, County Council's plans around the environment and um, could offer other opportunities in terms of uh, work-life balance and things. So plenty of good things happen that we'd like to reflect on and, and carry forward for the months to come. Absolutely. We're getting some quite specific questions. We won't be able to take all of them and I suspect that the panel might not be able to answer all of them. But what we will do is capture it and try to get back to people with specific answers where they exist in the guidance or, or try and seek those answers out. But there's a few, quite a few questions about touch points in the museum, AV guides, interactives, touch screens, etc etc so Laura you talked about not wanting to narrow the experience down just to a conveyor belt of people walking around galleries what what have you thought or have you, have you, how have you adapted around those areas where there might be uh, touch points or interactives yeah I mean we have had to think about that we've been through the whole site and it will mean that we've removed so we will have removed some of our interactive touch points um, to try and reduce that issue around touch screens. We, we were due this summer to bring in uh, the great AI exhibition that was at the Barbican that is 70% interactive about how, um, and we talked about that for quite a long time. We've decided to uh, delay bringing that exhibition to Liverpool, so we absolutely still intend to bring it, but we'll bring it in the new year because we felt that that was a step too far in terms of the, you know, we, we couldn't, remove the interactivity of it and so we'd rather wait to a point where people can fully experience that interactivity but within a uh, world museum on the walker um we have less of that kind of interactive approach i think that will become a challenge for us when we start to look at our, our waterfront venues particularly museum of liverpool um museum of liverpool is designed to be fully interactive for you to engage with lots of people for you to bump into one another and for you to be touching things much more difficult for us it's a real concern I think it, it depends on individual museums. I know that we have done individual risk assessments for looking at each part of that and where we can't make it safe, we've not used it. Any other thoughts on interactives? Because they have become a, you know, a, key, a key way of engaging audiences in some galleries. Uh, I think for us at Norfolk, we will we will have to uh, limit those so no dressing up no no interactives in the very short term i hope and don't expect that to be a long-term uh, policy and i think we'll get back to a point where we can do that um coming back to laura's excellent point about the visitor experience has got to be great from day one it's not enough to give a substandard experience because everybody who comes back from that first point will be expecting you know, a good experience, even if it's different. And I think we'll want to uh, increase the number of staff that are visible in galleries and around the museum in terms of the first person interpretation. So costume guides and, and, and ways to bring back some of that interactivity and social uh, engagement in a way that's not necessarily interactive. But I don't, I hope we've not seen the end of interactive far from it. I think it's a short term measure just to, just to, basically get us over that immediate kind of uh, safety first approach. Yes, thanks Steve. And a, a question, a, a really good question here about from Peter Nurik who's asking how do museums uh, see themselves supporting the most vulnerable in society such as those living with dementia or mental health challenges and a, another questioner asked about people who uh, have a disability who will have been isolated and disadvantaged already during lockdown how do we see ourselves serving those audiences and have there been any good examples of museums and galleries taking initiatives on this laura i mean you run the house of memories which is yeah. obviously you know and, a, a and, and, program in terms of dementia yeah it's a really it's a really important issue for us um because we you know <laughs> We talk all the time about being a museum that's, that, that's accessible for all and that welcoming to everybody and all of those kind of things. And we absolutely don't want to exclude 
a significant minority of our, of our communities in that way. House of Memories actually has been busier since lockdown than before that. We have a House of Memories has an app program. It has a digital content. Uh, we've had a lot more interest in House of Memories in the app, and, and we've been very, very busy using the House of Memories app, um, not just to help in terms of dementia, but also social isolation um, and on and all of those kind of things. So I think um, certainly when I was speaking to Carol Rogers, who's our director of House of Memories this morning, she seems busier than ever. And, and that's a really important program for us. It's just different. So whereas we'd have normally done training face to face, we're now looking at doing that online. Whereas we'd have normally done memory walks in the gallery, we're using our app contents to be able to do that with people remotely. Um, it's massively important. Any other thoughts on that in terms of serving audiences that might be uh, that have been isolated already by the pandemic? So from, from a Norfolk point of view, Sharon, I think, again, like Laura, there's <clears throat> certain sites we have specialisms in autism friendly work, dementia friendly work. Uh, in the last three months, we've been doing a huge amount of work on the digital side of things, volunteering with people, frankly, who, who might not be able to physically access the sites anyway. Uh, I think going forward in terms of the response, we need to be working with those groups and asking them what they want and how they want it. We've certainly had conversations with our adult social care colleagues and with public health about making time available in the museums for those people who have been shielding, who have been vulnerable, who want a safe day out that will be probably um, very, very, very carefully planned with support from specialist colleagues so that they don't have the concerns and worries about bumping into other members of the public because they'll have the, the the sites to themselves so special openings special timed availability and actually co-curation of the experience with the groups who we trust and know and need to engage with us so rather than us trying to guess what is the approach actually ask them and try and respond then uh, and that could be in the immediate future and it's certainly going to be in the medium and, and longer term as well Mm. And, and that's really critical, isn't it? And part of that welcome that we've had in the past has come from our front of house colleagues and that's been part of the really special warm welcome that I know all of the venues represented on the panel give. Have you done, there's a question here about wh whether the panel has consulted front of house colleagues and whether there's been any training put in place in order to support them to, to continue to give that warm welcome. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Either. We've lost yeah. David again. So, yeah. <laughs> Laura? Um, we've actually done, so we've done, we did a survey that was done through conversations with line managers at all of our staff right across, right across the whole organisation. Because, as I said before, staffing capacity is going to be potentially an issue for us. So we may need back of house staff to cover front of house shifts and all of those kind of things. So we, we've done a survey looking at what are the barriers towards coming back, how, how comfortable do people feel, what are their concerns, all of that kind of stuff. We've developed an online training programme for when people do come back that takes them through our COVID policies and our risk assessments and what's changed and what's different. And we're hoping to do a range of training in, in the kind of days up to, up to reopening that will focus on, on, on a lot of things, you know, it's a long time since everybody's been in the building, so we'll do all of that fire evacuation stuff and all of that again, but we'll also focus on how do we ensure that people feel safe and feel welcomed in, in our venues in a bizarre situation. And I think that's interesting, actually, I know speaking to other museum directors and leaders that because the, of the need for more front of house staff in this reopening situation, then back of house have been brought into those positions on a temporary basis. And you could see actually a much more homogenous and, uh, and greater understanding actually between different roles and, and, and greater uh, you know, understanding and, and valuing of those roles front of house but because, because people are having to fulfill them in, in this period. Yeah. Steve, have you done tr training with your staff? Yeah, I think training's ongoing. I think it's a really, really mm -hmm. good question, though. And again, we've got to support our staff to support the visitors and users in a different way. And frankly, you know, a lot of the things that we, we will need to, to work through, we've not yet experienced. Um, some staff are, you know, very, very eager to get back. Some staff are, you know, very, very understandably concerned about coming back. So it's meeting practical kind of um, uh, concerns and, and dealing with them. 
yeah. those but also giving that kind of you know what is the new experience and how we're going to flex to make sure it's um, as good as possible but lots lots of work to do on that key key area there's quite a few questions coming through on catering and retail how is that going to look different because obviously one of the issues for museums is three months worth of lost income and then lower predicted visitor numbers and are we going to be able to open cafes are we going to be able to open retail and, and you know is the till going to be rolling for for you in that situation laura what's what what's your experience what what are you planning to open uh, so we've already reopened the Museum of Liverpool Cafe, which is down on the Liverpool waterfront and has a degree of footfall. So we felt it was worth trying to reopen that and see what the footfall looked like. Um, so that's been open for a week or so now. Um, we are planning on opening. It's open with a grab and go offer for clarity, not breaking any laws. It is a grab and go offer. Um, and we plan to open our retail and our cafes when we open the venues, but again, potentially with a different type of offer. So we'll do a whole load of lot less hot food and that kind of stuff. It will probably be grab and go within our cafes to start with because we need to work out the social distancing rules around people sitting in. Um, we are encouraging contactless payments and all of that kind of stuff. There's a lot less stock in our shops when I walked through the other day because we, we've obviously had to create space for social distancing. But uh, we consider our retail and our cafe to be a core part of our public offer and so we intend to open with as much of it as we can safely do so. Right, I'm going to quickly ask David Mann a question before he disappears again. <laughs> so we've had quite a few questions, David, sorry, I've, about... I've gone already. Uh, <laughs> we've had questions about retail and cafe. What are you planning to do and what are your expectations and have you changed your offer? Will you change your offer when you reopen? The, the, the cafe will be reduced covers, uh, reduced menu, uh, reduced service, contactless payment. Uh. <laughs> so, so I think we've got that, that kernel <laughs> of advice there or experience from David. Steve, let's go to you. What are you doing with retail and cafe? Yeah, so catering is very, very difficult to see exactly the route through at the moment because two metres is different than one metre. It makes some things viable, other things that it doesn't. Uh, cleaning and, and, and hygiene, obviously, critical. So I think we'll open without catering on the key sites when we do open. I would like to think we could farm some sort of uh, 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 offer in terms of grab and go, take away pizza slices and things like that. Some local authorities, I believe, have a different... Um, interpretation of what takeaway is and whether it can be eaten on site so if you're not eating it in the cafe but are eating it in the grounds is that off site or on site in a different part of the site is the car park on site so really really confused messages and even our trading standards colleagues are struggling to interpret those in quite the way that um gives clarity in terms of that retail we will try and give a retail offer it will be a very very stripped down number of lines and probably we will change the physical location of the retail offer in at least norwich castle so the shop will remain closed because it's quite small and uh, social distancing is hard there but in the rotunda area it's quite easy so we'll probably sell uh, retail uh, items from beneath behind the information desk for at least the uh, the initial period of reopening Absolutely. I mean, I think we're all going to have to feel our way in this, aren't we? Because it will depend on local factors as, as well as any national guidance in any of the countries of the UK. So we've got a couple of bigger sort of questions uh, away from some of the detail. And, and I think some of the answers to the questions, we've got 49 questions on the Q&A. We're not going to go through them all, don't panic panel. Uh, but I think some of the detailed ones, you can find the answers in the guidance from NMDC and from AIM and from some of the summaries and Q&As on the Museums Association website, but we will try and look at them and, and point you in the right direction for the detail. Um, there's a really interesting one here about what government support is needed ongoing. So as we've got only England on the panel at the moment, let's think about what we need from here on in. So we've obviously had a, you know, a good response on emer emergency funding from the government in England and through ACE and the Heritage Fund, but what do we need next? Laura? 
uh, well, ultimately, we need continued support is what we need next. We, we're all going to be open when, you know, I think most of us are predicting a third of our normal visitor figures um, by anyone's calculation. That's not financially sustainable. Uh, so, you know, I run a business that, that's predicated on 3.1 million visitors and we're forecasting at best 700,000 for this year if we manage to get open and don't hit a second peak and 101 other things don't happen. Um, we are going to need continued financial support in in the short term. I think there's other things as well. You know, I, I'd be advocating quite loudly around um, uh, removal of the sunset clause on exhibitions tax relief because I think that's important that we keep those benefits that we've got. We obviously had great news from uh, from Ram the other day around business rates, which I think will be really helpful. But we need to make sure that we can support sectors to benefit from that. Um, and I think, you know, ultimately we need what we've seen in other countries. We need investment. Steve, do you agree with that? Anything in addition? I, I would definitely agree with all of those. I would add to them that, again, if you're a local authority run museum or local authority supported um, museum service, then the support to the local authorities is absolutely critical. So it's direct investment if you're a national. Um, in other areas, it's you know through Arts Council or, as we've said, the Heritage Fund, both of whom I think have been amazing in terms of support programme, have, as have many other grant giving trusts and foundations. I would add the tourism sector because the support for the tourism sector in terms of uh, both uh, domestic tourism and, 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 and international tourism is, is vital. So we need a whole system approach which is everything from transportation to, 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 to um, um, overall campaigns. I don't think we're in a position at this point for, for, for very obvious reasons for big uh, marketing campaigns about particular destinations. I think it's a safety first and let's just get open in some way and, and test the water and see how far we get. But it is, it is structural investment is needed for the museum sector, the heritage sector, and whichever your funding line, universities, local authorities, grant giving trusts and foundations, we need that structural support or we will, you know, we, we will struggle over the coming um, period. It's, it's a really, really, it's going to be a really tough challenge for the sector. Absolutely. And I mentioned at the beginning that Steve is one of the Museums Association's trustees and, and you'll know that we've been working with other sector organisations to really to make a strong case to governments across the UK for that continued funding so that whichever route it comes through, whether it's direct from government or through local authorities or through those trusts and foundations or the, the heritage funds, that it gets there and, it, and it's strategic as well so that it looks across the piece that where museums are delivering and, and where they need support. Just a, another interesting question that's popped up a couple of times, so I will take it, and that's about planning exhibitions or temporary exhibitions and loans. And I know this has popped up in other conversations that we've had as the Museums Association. So what are you planning in, in a normal cycle? Obviously, you'd have, uh, Laura, you referred to one of the exhibitions that you had upcoming, uh, but, what, but what's happening with exhibition planning and loans are we just going back to basics with our permanent ex uh, collections or have we still got plans in place so we've changed our program slightly in terms of time scale but we intend to open our um the linda mccartney photographic exhibition at walker in early august hopefully um and as i say ai we've pushed back so our exhibition program has been kind of pushed back, but we haven't made any significant changes. Loans, I think, is a much bigger problem. The amount of conversations I have about trying to get objects back from different countries that where they've been out on loan. And, you know, we now need we now need to send a courier to Japan and Japan won't let a courier in. Um, so that's and I think that will have a long term effect. I think that will affect loan programs and exhibition programs. But I think you'll see the. I think you'll see the impact of that, not immediately, but probably in 6, 12, 18 months. And, and, and possibly that could be a good thing if we're looking towards our, our own collections and maybe lending more locally. Steve, is there, what's the impact been for you and, and what do you see it being in the future? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think with the exception of the summer programme, because the summer programme has gone, we had exhibitions that, that we've, we've, we, we cannot carry those forward. But from the autumn onwards, the exhibition programme that we had is still in that shape. So it's exhibitions in the same slots. 
same aspirations, two major exhibitions planned for 2021, and we hope to carry those through at the moment. Uh, the pressure is on the budgets and um, even the, you know, how many visitors we'd have expected to get in for those uh, exhibitions. So it's inevitable that we're looking at probably the detail rather than the, 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 the what's happening uh, when. But I think longer term, absolutely all those things, international loans are going to be, if not impossible, then a lot more uh, challenging and the budgets will be heavily reduced and the numbers will be curtailed so looking more locally i'd love us to see this as a moment in time where again some of our programming changes in terms of our approach and it's absolutely much more about communities rebuilding access co-curation trying different things in a different way and all of those things you know to some extent have been we've dipped toes in water in some of those areas over the last three months and found that it's been a very successful um thing so that's where we'll get to okay just one specific question to both of you still no david um and that is because quite a few people have asked it are you doing only booked and timed entry in the first instance no would be the very brief answer to that uh, it came as a bit of a shock to us to be honest we we had seen the guidance on the whole uh, requirement for track and trace and to take contact details um, wasn't in it until quite late in the day so it's causing us some issues we won't so what we will do is we will offer a ticketed a free a free ticketed time slot event but we will allow walk on the day simply because digital literacy levels uh, in, in Liverpool City region and the percentage of our audience that don't have Wi-Fi and all of those kind of things it's a too big a barrier to entrance our audience are not used to booking a ticket and therefore we are currently or my colleagues are currently frantically working on how we safely ensure that we can take contact details quickly and efficiently and safely for people who walk up on the day um, we'll have to obviously do that and we'll have to do it both ways and we will absolutely be encouraging people to book in advance it would save us a whole load of time and effort if they could or to book on their smartphone when they turn up even if they haven't but if not we will ensure that there is a way in which we can do that because of accessibility and i think that digital divide has been really exposed over the last three months uh, are you taking bookings only steve are you planning that system yeah i think book time tickets but a very um specific tool for a short-term problem we would hope to get back to a much more open and accessible um, way of um, getting people through so small number of weeks rather than an extended period is, is is our thinking at the moment we also have weddings taking place at some of our sites and again that's been a further complication which we're still working through with uh, registrar colleagues um, and again different approach needed but now the government has said weddings can take place, albeit with smaller numbers of uh, people in the room. Um, we've got that additional kind of need as well. So that's not a pre-book group, but it's a group that we know with certain numbers that we'll have to accommodate within the total allocation of, of uh, people who can be in the building at one point in the short term. So that is a bit of a, a again, a logistical challenge at the moment, but we'll, we'll find a solution. Absolutely. I'm sure we're going to find solutions as we go along to lots of these interesting issues that we didn't think we were going to be dealing with four or five months ago. I'm going to end with a killer question from the, one of our participants. I think it's Gun Ken from Birmingham. What are the panel's personal thoughts on where they see the sector in a year's time? Laura. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I would hide the fact that I think it's going to be tough. And I think it's going to be tough not just for six to 12 months. I think it's going to be tough for probably three to five years because of the reliance on tourism and all of those things and for that to bounce back. Having said that, the museum sector has been around for hundreds of years and I believe we'll be here in hundreds of years time. So I hope that we don't, I hope two things really, half of me wants us to go back to whatever normal is and to do that quickly and half of me doesn't because actually normal wasn't all that great in some respects, it excluded a whole load of people and you know there was problems with normal. So um, I hope that we learn the lessons. Um, I'm absolutely confident that the sector as a whole will survive. Um, there will be museums in, in 12 months time, but I'm also more than well aware that not all of our museums will survive and that's an issue that the sector as a whole needs to deal with. Um, and, and I think it is really, really gonna be tough, um, but I hope that we get to a, a, a place where we come out of it 
better for it. Great. Steve, final thoughts on a year's time? Uh, yeah, ex exactly the same. I think it's going to be a challenging period, uh, particularly over the next six months. My overall feeling is the sector is incredibly strong very resilient extremely adaptable and the need and the what we can provide is 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 so important that we will be potentially in a different but even stronger place this time uh, next year i think the fundamental for me is we need to be so clear on what museums can do for the people who rely on us we, if we cannot answer that question clearly to ourselves and to the funders and the stakeholders and those who who who, who support us you know it will be much more difficult but if we can be crystal clear about the value and the help that we can provide to our communities and the value that we have to the visitor economy and recovery more generally in terms of the overall uh, uh, uk position uh, that will put us in as good a position as possible but i remain very very optimistic we're an amazing sector and we'll come through this stronger that's a great point at which to end. Thank you, Laura and Steve, and thank you to David, who was fleetingly with us, and hopefully who join us again at a future date. I'm going to hand back to Simon now, but thank you for all of your questions and for your participation on the panel. Thanks very much, Sharon. Uh, yes, uh, we hope you enjoyed the event. Uh, apologies, as Sharon said, that we, we lost David a, a few times. I'm sure he'll be back again and other MA events soon. Uh, there was some great chat, um, lots of great ideas and uh, I questions being exchanged. We had more than 50 questions to the panel, so that was really good. Uh, but please do feedback what you thought of the event uh, to us. We really want to learn and improve uh, what we offer. Uh, a quick reminder that our next coronavirus conversation is in a fortnight. The subject of that will be exploring uh, new ways of thinking, working and engaging with collections in the post-COVID uh, world. Uh, the full list of speakers will be announced soon on the MA website. Um, that's where the details are to book as well. And just to remind you, the MA website is a place to go for details of all our forthcoming events, the funding we offer, our, our campaigns and our professional development offer. So good luck to all of you with your reopening plans for your museums. Uh, I hope this webinar helped uh, your planning in what is a, you know, a challenging and difficult thing to do. But, but I know everyone's looking forward to welcoming back visitors. So good luck with that. And finally, thanks to all the speakers and thanks to everyone for attending. I'll see you again soon.